Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, a lot of universities now give lip service to the idea of interdisciplinarity and people talking across different uh, disciplinary divides, but you rarely actually see it in action. So it's really tremendous to see uh, open grounds in action and play a very, very small part in it today. I'm just thrilled to be here. Uh, certain images, this is actually supposed to be green on my screen, so it's uh, <laughs> green. Uh, Certain images stand out as icons of American environmentalism. A public service announcement featuring the crying Indian who sheds a tear in response to litter and pollution. Jane Fonda starring in The China Syndrome, a Hollywood film about the dangers of nuclear power, released just two weeks before the notorious accident at Three Mile Island. The sorrowful spectacle of oil-soaked wildlife following the Exxon Valdez and other oil spills. And more recently, the polar bear on melting ice together with Al Gore delivering his global warming slideshow, The Inconvenient Truth. These images and others like them have helped make environmental consciousness central to American public culture. Yet most histories of environmentalism ignore the crucial role these images have played in the very making of the environmental movement. So today what I'd like to do is share some themes and examples from my current book project, which is going to try to offer a new history of environmentalism through a focus on visual images ranging from the fear of radioactive fallout during the Cold War to global warming today, I look at a, a wide array of, of text, visual text, pictures in popular magazines, television news reports, advertisements, cartoons, films, and posters, and raise larger questions about the visual politics of environmentalism. In what ways have media spectacles and depictions of crisis allowed environmentalists to reach mass audiences? How have the visual media helped set the agenda of environmental politics by legi legitimating certain ideas to the exclusion of others? And to what extent has the visual media both advanced and constrained the environmental agenda? Now, these are some big, broad questions. And in trying to answer the questions, I try to approach images differently from how they are often treated in historical scholarship. Too often, historians present pictures as mere illustrations as passive mirrors to events elsewhere. In contrast, what I try to do is consider images as active rhetorical agents that define and delimit the scope of popular environmentalism. So media images do not simply illustrate environmental politics, but they also act as politics by naturalizing particular meanings of environmentalism. As they draw a broader public of consumers into popular environmentalism, Images act as both revelations and veils, creating tensions between what they visualize and what they hide, which ideas they endorse and which they deny. So in this talk, I'm going to focus mostly on media images produced during the 60s and early 70s. And this is a period uh, that led to the emergence of modern environmentalism. Uh, as Bill mentioned, I have ongoing interest in the history of landscape photography and environmental art. Uh, but I decided for this presentation I'd like to concentrate on media images uh, as a way to introduce another set of images that form part of the broader context and conversation about the environmental future and about the link between photography and environmental action. So environmental images from the 60s and 70s also established some of the key motifs and representational strategies that recur throughout the history of modern environmentalism. And they created templates for what I'm going to call environmental citizenship. And when I use this term environmental citizenship, I'm referring to the ecological rights and responsibilities of citizens. And this ranges from state policies that promise to protect people from toxicity and environmental danger to the kinds of ecologically responsible actions people try to engage in in daily life, recycling, energy conservation, et cetera. And I argue that the visual media function as an important technology of environmental citizenship and I try to understand how images have enlarged, uh, delimited, or otherwise defined the scope of right, ecological rights and responsibilities in modern America. What I'll be focusing on today is how images helped popularize an ecological lens. And this is a way of seeing that placed human bodies and the non-human world in a shared, interlinked realm of escalating danger. So the ecological lens uh, depends upon this notion of humans and nature sharing a space that seems increasingly threatened. By suggesting that all Americans were equally vulnerable to danger, these images helped visualize the environmental crisis to mass audiences 
and they place new demands upon the state to protect the citizenry from harm. But at the same time, as we'll see, many media images have often masked large-scale systemic causes of environmental degradation and instead have focused on the idea of universal responsibility, the idea that all Americans, all consumers, are equally culpable for pollution and other environmental problems. So they've tended to emphasize personal responsibility rather than structural solutions to the environmental crisis. And so ultimately, media images have offered environmentalists a double-edged sword. It's helped them popularize their cause, but also distorted their ideas by portraying their movement as a moralistic crusade to absolve the nation of its environmental guilt. Now, although I'm not going to be focusing on landscape photography today, I would like to begin with one example. Um, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that directly connects to one of the exhibits going on with Freyland. In 1960, the Sierra Club, one of the nation's leading conservation groups, published This is the American Herd, which is a coffee table book featuring photographs by Ansel Adams and numerous other photographers, as well as a poetic text written by Nancy Newall. The book borrowed from the Jeremiah tradition, a long a tradition in American culture, that allowed them to judge and condemn American history, to present the story of the nation as one of a people turning a rich continent into a wasteland. So the book documents all kinds of environmental problems, suburban sprawl, air and water pollution, pesticide proliferation, and conveys a sense of a gradually escalating, ever worsening environmental crisis. But it closes with a vision of pure wilderness. Newhall writes that wilderness allows you to walk where only the wind has walked before. So it, the book concludes with a fantasy of discovery, presenting wilderness as a place of grace, uncorrupted by modern society, a point reinforced by Adam's clearing winter storm and other photographs of his from the West that close the book. So the book frames nature as this pure, sacred space apart from human society. And the Sierra Club defines environmental citizenship as the right of citizens to experience natural beauty, to gain a kind of therapeutic relief through contact with wild nature. This will be the first in a series of coffee table books published by the Sierra Club, all of which work to maintain the boundaries between nature and culture, to use the sublime aesthetic to glorify the supposedly pure realm of wilderness. And this is beyond the scope of my talk today, but I will just mention that within landscape photography, including the work of Robert Adams and other artists who are displaying the other exhibit at the Freyland, there would emerge a number of challenges to the wilderness aesthetic, uh, beginning with the new photographics uh, and other shows that Bill mentioned. Photographers would reject this dualistic view of pure nature and profane society, and instead begin to focus on entangled environments. So by relinquishing the myth of purity, they would point to the profound interconnections between human society and the natural world. Likewise, the ecological lens that I'll be focusing on envelop both humans and nature in a common geography of long-term incremental danger. So rather than calling on the state to protect these sublime spaces uh, for the benefit of citizens to experience wild beauty, the ecological lens blurs the boundaries between nature and culture and warns about the survival of people and non-human nature in ecological systems that are increasingly threatened by pollution, pesticides, and toxicity. So for example, in the early 60s, at the same time that the Sierra Club continues to publish coffee table books, SANE, the Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy, released a series of advertisements in the New York Times and other papers that warned of the dangers of radioactive fallout caused by nuclear weapons testing. This is uh, during the 50s when the US government sending off bombs in Nevada to test the effectiveness of nuclear weapons. And there's concerns that radioactive fallout is ending up in milk and into uh, food systems and ultimately threatening human health, particularly the health of children. The group's most widely circulated ad featured Dr. Benjamin Spock, who was the respected child expert, best-selling author of a child uh, parenting manual from that period. The ad was captioned, Dr. Spock is worried, and it shows Spock brooding uh, over the dangers of fallout next to a young toddler in a space in which, as the nation's child expert, he should feel most confident and assured. The text below the images uh, addresses parents as his prime audience. I am worried, he said, 
As the tests multiply, so will the damage to children. Another sane ad showed three youngsters all with big smiles and uh, shiny white teeth. But the text below undercuts this carefree image. Your children's teeth, it warns with scientific certainty, contain strontium-90. So these ads begin to popularize the notion of the ecological body by showing how strontium-90 and other radioactive agents could enter the food chain and threaten human health. The ads fuse fact with feeling, reason with emotion, to reveal the long-term risks to children's bodies. I think this is an important point in environmental imagery. Uh, rather than thinking about cognition and emotion, fact and feeling in separate realms, there's often a fusion of these kind of domains in environmental imagery. <laughs> what we see emerging in these ads and other texts from this period is a way to picture the temporality of environmental risks, the temporality of the environmental crisis. And this is a mode of danger that I think is quite different from ideas of nuclear apocalypse, which depend upon a sudden notion of immediate and catastrophic devastation. Rather, this notion of gradual accumulation of agents in the human body and in the environment um, gives us another sense of time, another way of thinking about our relation to the environment. Um, the literary critic Rob Nixon, uh, in, a, in a great book that I highly recommend, terms this form of ecological calamity slow violence. A violence, he explains, that occurs gradually and out of sight a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space. An attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. And I would agree that the material realities of slow violence pose a very serious representational challenge for environmentalists as they try to engage with the spectacle-driven dictates of the mass media, as they seek to move beyond this notion of immediate catastrophe to warn of incremental crises in the making. In the case of Sane, the focus on children's bodies provided a way to render visible the invisible threat of fallout, provided an emotional emblem for the long-term danger represented by the accumulation of strontium 90 in the environment and in the human body. These ads would soon be joined by other media images that warn of the dangers of DDT and other pesticides. Uh, this is a photograph that was in National Geographic uh, by George Silk. It showed the effects on eggs, uh, ibises that could not uh, hatch or were deformed eggs uh, due to the effects of DDT. Uh, likewise, this connection between the danger to nature and humans would emerge in a poster that was actually printed in Time Magazine in 1970, just before the first Earth Day, that warned of the pesticide content in breast milk. Uh, and you see superimposed on breasts, caution to keep out of the reach of children. Milk in such containers may be unfit for human consumption. These images also create a picture of universal victimhood, universal vulnerability, suggesting that all Americans, no matter their race or class, no matter their social economic position, are equally vulnerable to environmental danger. And this focus on white bodies uh, as the stand-in for the nation is a frequent uh, trope within environmental imagery. So in the time leading up to Earth Day, you see air pollution uh, portrayed in a similar fashion. This is from Life Magazine. You see a white girl named Sarah and a white woman named Lucy both wearing gas masks. It's supposed to resemble a family snapshot, but it also gives us a sense uh, of an apocalyptic future in which women and children are going to be forced to wear gas masks to survive the polluted atmosphere. So in addition to visualizing the need for the state to protect the citizenry from harm, Images like this one also obscure differences between different social groups. Marginalizing questions of race, class, and equality, the visual media have often portrayed all Americans as equally vulnerable to danger. So they've made the idea of an environmental crisis visible to a mass public, but they've often ignored the structural inequities that produce environmental injustice. And all kinds of studies would suggest that certain social groups, primarily the poor and racial minorities, are more subjected to certain forms of toxic contamination. This emphasis upon universal vulnerability has been paralleled by another recurring motif, and that is the notion of universal responsibility, the idea that all Americans are equally culpable for environmental degradation. Now, this concept also depends upon the ecological lens, because it suggests that all of us are entangled in complex ecological systems and that our daily actions affect, directly affect, the environment in the future. 
I think the most famous depiction of this theme uh, is the ad that came out in 1971, a public service announcement for Keep America Beautiful, uh, an anti-litter group that had to be funded by uh, all the major beverage and packaging companies who at the time were opposed to bottle bills, legislation that would require people to use, companies to produce returnable bottles as they, as they had up until very recently. Uh, in an effort to stop uh, bottle bills, Keep America Beautiful turns to the idea of litter to suggest that it's each and every one of your, your fault that the, the landscape is littered. It has nothing to do with corporate production decisions to produce disposable packaging. The TV commercial starred Iron Eyes Cody, an actor in native garb, who paddles a canoe in water that seems at first tranquil and pristine, but becomes increasingly polluted on his journey. He pulls his boat from a water, but the water he walks toward a bustling freeway, and the passenger hurls a paper bag, which bursts on the ground, scattering fast food wrappers all over his beaten moccasins. In a stern voice, the narrator intones, some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. Some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. And the camera zooms in very closely on Iron Eyes Cody's face, so you see a single tear dropping ever so slowly down his cheek. And I think that single key tear contributed to its visual power. It's a, a moment of emotional eloquence captured and aestheticized by the camera. The conceptual brilliance of the ad also stemmed from its ability to incorporate elements of the environmentalist critique of progress, as well as the Countercultural's embrace of a certain idea of Indianness as a marker of oppositional identity. So the, the commercial offers the public a resistant narrative, but also it deflects attention from industry practices. Many environmentalists condemn the ad for its exclusive focus on individual responsibility. And again, because Keep America Beautiful was you know, actively involved in uh, lobbying against certain environmental measures. Yet over time, this vision of environmental citizenship becomes increasingly dominant in American public life. Now I'm going to skip very rapidly ahead here uh, to the period surrounding Earth Day 1990. So if you skip ahead about 20 years, the 20th celebration of Earth Day, you see increasingly this intention on uh, consumers as the prime means of change. And this is at the very same moment when market metaphors are becoming increasingly dominant in American public life. And there's faith in personal responsibility for market-based solutions to all environmental problems. The private sphere becomes the main site of environmental action, the place where virtuous consumers can atone for their ecological sins through recycling and other individual acts. The recycling logo had been developed around the time of the first Earth Day in 1970, and it suddenly becomes ubiquitous around the time of Earth Day in 1990 uh, as emblems of sustainability. A reminder for consumers to take personal responsibility for the planetary future. And you also start to see recycling programs become more you know, implemented, more part of daily life during this time. The ecological lens also acquires global significance during this period. So a recycling ad produced by the Environmental Defense Fund with the cooperation of the Ad Council, the same group that did uh, the Crying Indian commercial almost 20 years earlier, said, if you're not recycling, throwing it all away. You have this iconic image of the whole Earth uh, connected to the notion of citizen responsibility for the planetary future. So during this period, the media would frequently frame environmental hope as a kind of therapy for consumers, a way for them uh, to deal with all the distressing imagery of environmental crisis that was coming through the popular media. Environmental images often depend upon a notion of consumers as victims of the market potential victims of toxicity and other things produced by the market. But this frame, what I call a therapeutic frame, reimagines consumers as empowered players in the market. And it codifies what some might call a neoliberal model of citizenship or a neoliberal model of environmentalism. For the past five decades, the growth of environmentalism has been entwined with mass media spectacles of environmental crisis. But the goals and ideas of environmentalists have not always corresponded with conventions of media coverage. Depictions of crisis, appeals to audience emotions, have heightened particular concern uh, for specific manifestations of risk, but they've often failed to communicate more far-reaching ways to deal with larger, slowly escalating problems. From the coverage of Fremont Island, 
uh, to oil spill coverage, we get a focus upon the specific rather than the structural. So in the case of Three Mile Island, the, uh, the cooling towers become the iconic emblems of nuclear fear, uh, and it focuses really on the nuclear power plant as the sole uh, exclusive site of environmental risk, ignoring the longer processes of production and waste that are involved in the nuclear fuel cycle, from uranium mining, often on indigenous lands, to the multi-millennial half-lives of uh, radioactive waste that are often not thought about, not seen, in terms of focus on cooling towers. Likewise, oil spill imagery often focuses on the sad spectacle of threatening all wildlife, but ignores the ongoing broader threats of fossil fuel dependence. Moreover, even when the popular media depict gradually escalating problems, the dominant framing of environmentalism is short circuit time by promoting a green consumerist vision of the flood of salvation. And I think to bring this to an end, a prime example of this would be Al Gore's in the truth, which uh, visualizes the long-term escalating crisis of global warming, but ultimately prescribes short-term consumer solutions, purchasing energy-efficient light bulbs, hybrid vehicles, carbon offsets, to overcome the climate crisis. So throughout the history of modern environmentalism, the visual media's focus on spectacles of crisis and individual moral choices has hidden underlying causes and structural solutions behind a veil of inattention. So even as media images popularize the cause, they've often left crucial issues outside of the frame. Thank you very much.